WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive, always with you. After the Preakness, the Orioles headed up to New York all week long doing the Yankee Stadium thing. And, of course, the Baltimore Ravens getting prepared for a season that's just about to start, right? Look, the season's got to be ready to start here. It's, it's only late May. We got OTAs. We have mandatories coming up. Luke joins us now. We're going to be at um, at the local in Falston between now and then. Uh, from the Maryland Lottery and our friends at Window Nation, I got the hat. I got the shirt. 866 Nation. Reminder, last couple of days for that 0% financing for five years. Take advantage of that. Uh, Luke, you're taking advantage of uh, watching the Orioles and forgetting about the Ravens a little bit. But the Ravens are still doing things. The fact that the Orioles are playing meaningful games every night in the Bronx and it matters and they're the rage. You know, Odell Beckham uh, starting to preakness over the weekend. I saw Harbaugh running around over there and Marlon Humphrey at the at Old Hilltop. Uh, it is still a football operation going on around here. And certainly as much as the Orioles have taken the front page, the Ravens below the fold will be interesting at least enough over the next couple of weeks to see how this whole thing comes together with Todd Munkin. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, football never really goes away. Uh, the, the closest it comes to going away at this point is those first couple of weeks in July. You know, your post mini camp and everyone at the building gets away for a little while. And uh, there's not a whole lot of news that goes on that time of year in the NFL, but uh, plenty of excitement. As you mentioned, there was you know, a glimpse of some Ravens players uh, over the weekend at Preakness. And uh, certainly with OTA starting this week, business starts to pick up. It's still voluntary, still no contact, but this is the first time you have 11 on 11. This is the first time you have offense versus defense as opposed to a uh, very controlled kind of glorified walkthroughs during football school, uh, as they call it. Uh, which is the second phase of the off-season workout program. But uh, this is the week where the questions start to ramp up a little bit in terms of who's there, who isn't there, and obviously Lamar Jackson being the big question. But, hey, where's Patrick Queen? Hey, uh, is J.K. Dobbins going to be there? Is Odell Beckham going to be there? I mean, guys who haven't necessarily been in the building a whole lot to this point, which is not a big deal. And, and I'll remind everyone that, Ed Reed and Ray Lewis and Terrell Suggs were not guys that were there for the earliest portions of the offseason program, but it's certainly interesting to track who's there, who isn't, even if in the big picture it's not necessarily all that consequential typically, but will be intriguing. And as you mentioned, I think there's plenty of interest to see what this operation starts to look like under Todd Munkin. And not that they're going to give away too much uh, with what's going on in front of the media, but there's certainly intrigue and interest. And as you mentioned, even though the Orioles are certainly doing everything they can to capture the imagination of the local sports scene, it's still football and it's still the Ravens. And on the heels of Lamar Jackson being extended, I think there's plenty of excitement. And uh, not that it's not, not that everyone's curiosity is going to be fully satisfied because we're only talking about practices and helmets and shells and shorts, but still going to be good to get a look at this football team and start to not answer questions, but start to monitor the potential answers for questions uh, that still pertain to this roster. Yeah, I think it's just it's a time for the questions, not to answer the questions. Yeah. It's the time to say who's going to play left guard. You know, what's the rotation going to look like on the defensive side? How are they going to distribute the football um, in the passing game, given this many receivers and we don't talk about Mark Andrews and all this because it's Beckham, <laughs> Beckham, Beckham, and Lamar, Lamar, Lamar. But there's still other players, and Ronnie Stanley, who's, you know, still one limp away from not playing anymore, right? Like, I mean, we put him in as an as because he played the end of the year last year. That this time, the last three years, you've been questioning where he's going to be. Um, what you do your twelve thoughts. I've just given you a couple thoughts for me. The most interesting thing for me is the Munkin offense and what they're going to try to do that looks and feels different from what Greg Roman did. Yeah, and I mean, you and I have, have scrimmaged and, and fought and, and debated about how much more they're going to throw. Uh, I've said all along, I don't think they're going to abandon the running game by any means. And I think you'd have a very unhappy J.K. Dobbins and an offensive line if suddenly you were just in pass sets all the time. But they're going to throw more. And I think it's going to be a different looking kind of an offense. And I think uh, one thing that, that comes to mind for me, not that we're going to really necessarily glean anything from it uh, as far as OTAs go, but how much more spread, how much how much more does this team try to spread out and run more 11 personnel, more three wide receiver sets? I mean, you clearly added at wide receiver. I don't think that 
means you're going to continue to play a lot of two tight end sets. You know, I think there'll be a time and a place for that, but I certainly don't think that's going to be their identity anymore. And by the way, you can run out of 11 personnel. You can have a lighter box for J.K. Dobbins and this offensive line to, to block. You know, it doesn't have to be all uh, com- compressed and and, tr- and really uh, busy uh, in the middle of the field. You can spread out and run that way. But I think that's the big fascination right now is what the passing game looks like. And uh, as I noted, and as Todd Munkin acknowledged uh, a couple weeks ago when he spoke to the media that as excited as he is with all these weapons that have been added to the picture, he flat out acknowledged, hey, there's one football. Uh, and that's, you know, that that's always going to be the case. And not that this, not that I'd call this wide receiver room an embarrassment of riches now. I, I don't think they're that incredibly prolific, but it's certainly much improved. Uh, but you mentioned it. Mark Andrews is still this team's best receiver. Look, no disrespect to Beckham or Rashad Bateman or the potential of Zay Flowers, but Mark Andrews has been an all pro tight end and he's been that dynamic, that great of a player, you know, a top two or three tight end over the last few years easily. Uh, so, you know, that, that it's going to be interesting to see how all of that looks. You know, I, I look at the offense and, you know, the big question from a position perspective, standpoint that still stands out is who is going to be the left guard you know it's kind of the one uh, position putting aside personnel groupings and how much Patrick Ricard's going to play in a Munkin offense compared to a Greg Roman offense but who's replacing Ben Powers is it Ben Cleveland Uh, is it John Simpson is it Patrick McCary is it some unnamed veteran who will be added between now and September Uh, so that's the the one position you know the one competition that's kind of you know up for grabs on the offensive side of the ball now defense uh there's some other positions you could talk about but i i just think there's a lot of excitement because you have lamar under contract you've added to the wide receiver room you return four of your five offensive linemen you return your top two running backs who should be healthier than they were a year ago as they're another year removed from their respective acl injury you have Mark Andrews and two other talented young tight ends who both flashed last year. There are no excuses for, for this offense to to not be really, really, really good, if not great. So go do it. And that doesn't mean you're going to see it during OTAs because it is just practice and it, it's not even full blown practice just yet. But it's going to be our first glimpse. And as you mentioned, uh, this is the time where you don't answer those questions, but we begin to monitor them. You know, who's lining up as the left guard first? You know, who's getting the first team reps? Uh, you know, what does the wide receiver rotation kind of look like? Uh, you know, how much is Mark Andrews lining up in the slot as opposed to in line? And how much is Patrick Ricard involved? And all those different questions. So it's fun. Uh, you know, you don't make too much out of it. Uh, and certainly I'll be the first to tell you that there are so many guys I can recall this time of year looking great and you start to say wow this guy's really taking a step forward and this guy's going to be a big part of what they do and then they're forgotten the second week of training camp or they're forgotten after the second preseason game so you always keep that in mind to to be measured in in how you're looking at all this but there's so much interest there's so much enthusiasm and i think this this week will be a, a nice you know early preview of seeing exactly what that's going to look like come september you know, for you with pickups and where they are and where they're lacking in their roster, we spent four months, right, talking about they're missing this, they lack that, they got to sign the quarterback, they got to sign the quarterback, they got to sign the quarterback. If they don't sign the quarterback, what happens? Now that it's all sort of done, are you convinced that that they're happy with where they are in regard to salary cap? adding players. I mean, where are the additions? We were wondering the additions in the cornerback. Well, they did that, right? How are they going to make the wide receiver? Well, they did that, right? They're going to get the, well, they did that, right? So who are they going to draft? Well, they drafted in the wide receiver room, at least initially. Um, The linebacker room would have been a big issue last year until Roquan Smith came along. I Mm -hmm. mean, DaCosta is really buttoned up where the things we could talk about in the end of May and at OTAs to say, well, where are there? We sit here with the Orioles right now and they're great, but they need pitching. You know, we can look at it and say that, right? We know there's going to be a cavalry. I don't know what the, what this football team, I, I feel like they've done the work they've needed to do in the off season. I give them, you know, give them high marks on putting a roster together that looks credible on Memorial day, at least. 
Yeah, and, and and you just said it. I mean, is it a roster that you would feel good about if there were no additions and you're going into the season thinking it's complete enough everywhere that you feel like you're a playoff, a strong playoff contender and all that? Yeah. Are there positions that I still have some questions or some potential concerns? Of course. I mean, I already mentioned left guard on the offensive side of the ball. You're always wanting depth everywhere, right? I mean, you know that there, there's that potential, and we saw this a couple years ago, that if you get uh, a few injuries at, the, at one position group, you're going to be in trouble. And that's something that every team deals with. So there's only so much you can do with that, with the salary cap, with some of – not just the Lamar contract, which still – Really, you're, you aren't going to feel the real effects of that for a couple more years from a, a cap perspective, but they've got lots of high-priced players. I mean, that, that's part of the deal when you, you have good players. you got to pay them. Uh, but on the defensive side, you know, a couple positions I still look to. I'll start it up front. Defensive line, I feel good about it. I don't think it's necessarily a great group, but I think they do have depth for 2023. Now, a long-term outlook for that group, I think there's question because – you don't have a whole lot under contract beyond this year other than Travis Jones or third round pick from a year ago. So, you know, they're, they're going to miss Calais Campbell. Do I think that's a, an insurmountable kind of personnel loss? No, but I, you're hoping that Michael Pierce, even though he's not the same, you know, he's more of a nose than a five technique, three technique kind of guy, but you hope his healthy return helps to alleviate some of what you missed there with, without Calais Campbell. Uh, so, my long-term concern about the defensive line is there. Short-term, I feel good about it. You know, not great, but good. Linebacker, you know, off-ball. I mean, obviously you have Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen, and you drafted Trenton Simpson to replace Patrick Queen after this season, presumably. I, I think that's the realistic uh, outcome. But edge rushers, I, I, I don't know. It feels like an embarrassment of riches a little bit at the linebacker position. It feels like they're stronger than you would have thought they were going to be because we think differently about Queen at this position. And we sort of know it's the end for him. And we we also know that he's playing to get paid, right? So, like, yeah. you're going to get a version of Patrick Queen out there looking to get a $60 million deal, literally. You would hope so, right? I mean, and, and that's where I mentioned, I mean, he, he being one of those players of interest in terms of is he showing up for OTAs or does he stay away? I mean, I think he has every motivation to say, yeah, I'm a little – frustrated I didn't get the fifth year option and I'm a little frustrated that the Ravens paid Roquan Smith and got him when when they drafted me a couple years ago but boy I'm gonna get to play with a, a guy like that next to me and I already am coming off of my best season and I'm gonna have a chance to to put up numbers and they're gonna put me in good positions to blitz and play downhill and do the things that I do best and and probably hide me a little bit from some of the things I struggle with a little bit more because Roquan is there Oh, he's in a great spot. So I, I think an off-ball linebacker, you're feeling good. Now, Edge, look, they have Adafe Owe. They have David Ajabo. I think everyone's going to be looking at Ajabo big time this year with him being fully healthy and having a normal offseason and knowing last year was essentially a red shirt. But could they stand to add another Edge guy between now and the start of the season, whether it's bringing back Justin Houston or adding someone of that ilk? Yeah, I, I think you look at the numbers there, you'd like to add another piece to the mix and that doesn't mean it's going to be a, the, the highest profile guy but you know Justin Houston enjoyed his time here I, I think certainly he left the door open Eric DaCosta left the door open at the start of the offseason I would not be shocked to see Justin Houston or someone like that added to the mix but you're counting on Owe and, and Ojabo let's face it I mean those are guys that you drafted in the first round and then the other guy you viewed as a first round pick that you got in the second round because he was hurt last year so Lots of pressure on those two. Lots of expectations on those two. Always coming off of an underwhelming year. There's no question about it. He's a guy that, you know, if you want to say it's the hot seat or he's under the microscope or however you want to characterize it, he certainly, you know, I think that would be an appropriate description. So, you know, Edge is still one of those places where, you know, I don't think it's necessarily bad, but it's a place where I think they could still stand to have an addition between now and the start of the season. So, and then in the secondary, you know, they, they added Rocky Sin, so they, they have that outside corner spot opposite Marlon Humphrey. Decided on paper at the very least, but who's going to be the slot corner? I think that's still a question because it was Hamilton last year, but Hamilton's moving into a starting safety role with Chuck Clark, uh, now a, a New York Jet. So that's still something I look to that still look at the corner depth. They have lots of young corners, but are those corners ready to be legit depth? 
or are they inventory, right? So, you know, we've, we've talked about that for a number of times over the years. You need at least a couple of those guys to take the next step to really be viable depth that, that you have confidence in. Guys that you feel that if someone goes down, they can step in and play at a high level. So, you know, I, I, I still have concern. I, I don't know if it's, you know, it's not grave concern, but would I like to see them add another corner? Uh, to the mix uh, or maybe it's a safety and you, you know, that, that allows Hamilton to play the nickel uh, when you get into sub packages uh, and do, do it like that. Yeah. I think you could do it that way as well, but you know, that's that, those are a couple of the positions that I point to and say, not that you're not ready to play, not that you're not ready to win games in September as the roster is presently constructed. But if you're ter- talking in terms of tweaking and fine tuning and really trying to optimize this roster, those are the positions that I look at right now and say, yeah, I think there's a- another veteran addition or two in-, in order, not necessarily this week or-, or even next month, but between now and the start of the season, I could certainly envision that happening. And And I think with the Lamar deal being done and some of the flexibility that they have, it's not a ton, but it's more than they certainly had. Uh, I think they're in position where if the right move presents itself, I think Eric DaCosta will be able to make that move and enhance this roster even more than where it is right now. Yeah, you know, with Lamar, I don't know what we're waiting to see here other than playbook. He's been out running around. There's video of him throwing the ball down in Florida. And, you know, we all the I wasn't the guy that felt like Joe Flacco needed to be out in April throwing footballs with uh, uh, with his wide receivers. But clearly the Internet feels that way. Right. So seeing Lamar stepping into that, but Lamar coming back here and doing it here and doing it in front of you and the reporters that are out there and, and standing. This is a this is a peacock moment for a couple of weeks for the organization, much like the press conference was two weeks ago to say, yeah, we, we kind of kept it all together here. We're 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 marching in the same direction because it certainly didn't feel that way for months and months and months and months. It would be a good look to have all of them look like they're marching in the same direction. And it's a time for play instead of for pay. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, Lamar needs to be there. I mean, he does at this point. I mean, and you know, I, I very much defended his his prerogative last year at this time where understanding he wasn't under contract and it was voluntary OTAs. We know the expectation of a franchise quarterback. And especially now when you were just given a five-year $260 million contract extension, because if you're not there at this point, and look, I'm not saying it has to be a perfect attendance kind of a deal, but if he's not out there for most of the next three weeks, you know, what message is that sending to the rest of your teammates who are out there? Uh, and, And that applied last year. But last year, there was a business element to this that was very clear and obvious. Uh, and we saw how long it took. So that was a, a symptom of how painful and, uh, and long and, and difficult the negotiating process was. And we said that at the time, that that was a symptom that all wasn't perfectly fine with that. So it is fine now. He signed on the dotted line. He's under contract for the next five years. The team has its franchise quarterback, and they're not having to talk about Will Levis or Anthony Richardson <laughs> or whoever they might have drafted or or whoever they might have signed as a veteran. They've got their guy. This so, team has no holes right now, Luke. No holes. Learn right? the Todd Munkin. <laughs> I mean, learn the, learn the Todd Munkin offense and start throwing to your receivers. And lo- no one's saying it's of this dire consequence of what's going to happen the next few weeks. Just – you know, be out there and, and I expect him to be out there. Let's be clear about this. I expect him to be out there. I'd be, if he's not out there the next couple of weeks, I'd be really surprised by that. And I think that would be a bad look on his part because you are talking about a brand new coordinator and some new weapons with your offense. And oh yeah, you're coming off of an injury and you haven't played since early December. And according to Lamar, when I asked him uh, at his press conference in early May, uh, how long he had been fully cleared, how long his knee had been right. You know, he said it had been, about a month or a little over a month at that point. So, you know, this was an injury that he was dealing with until February or March, right? So, you know, be out there and that's kind of what you're going to see around the league. Not that every quarterback is there for every single minute of every single OTA, but the the general expectation is that quarterbacks are out there. That's why they get the big bucks. So I I think he'll be out there. Uh, I think, uh, you know, his attendance to me should be much ado about nothing and we'll see, Uh, Other veteran players kind of be in and out uh, on and off the field. And that's kind of how it works this time of year. And that's fine. And, you know, we'll have some fun observations to talk about and certainly shouldn't take it too seriously. But uh, this is the time of year where you're starting to lay that groundwork. And 
Uh, I think there's a lot of excitement uh, to see this entire thing come together and, and see what it starts to look like under Todd, Todd Munkin as the offensive coordinator. Luke, give me an O. It's baseball oh. season. There we go. It's baseball season. <laughs> uh, Luke will be watching all things Yankees this week and Orioles and monitoring all things at Owings Mills. You can find him at Baltimore Luke and, of course, at Luke at WNST.net. I'm Ness at BaltimorePositive.com. We're easy to find around here from LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram through the Twitter place and at the local. And Foster will be giving away the uh, Maryland Lottery scratch-offs, the 50th anniversary in progress. Ryan Mountcastle at a $50,000 home run last week for Barb. All that's up at the front of BaltimorePositive.com. Stay with us. we got plenty ahead.